Amendment tutorial is uh, gives me the opportunity to introduce Dr. William Timberlake. Dr. Timberlake uh, received his master's and PhD from the University of Michigan, uh, began publishing in 1967, and has systematically integrated the ecological and laboratory approaches in the study of behavior. He's analyzed sensory, cognitive, motor, regulatory, and rhythmic structures underlying behavior, focusing primarily but not exclusively on learned behavior. Uh, he has developed a framework that combines the control possibilities of the laboratory with important ecological and phylogenetic variables that determine behavior in natural environments. Dr. Timberlake is a highly productive researcher who, since 1967, has published over 125 articles. Uh, Dr. Timberlake is currently a professor of psychology at Indiana University. Uh, he's received many awards for his research and teaching, including the Pointer Exxon, Exxon Fellowship uh, twice. His uh, facet award for excellence in teaching at Indiana University in 1999. In 2000 and 2001, he is the Cattell Foundation Sabbatical Award. Uh, he is a fellow in both the APA and APS and has served on the editorial board of Behavior Analysis Letters, JAB, Animal Learning and Behavior, Behaviorism, uh, Journal of Experimental Psychology, the Animal Behavior Processes, and is currently on the editorial board of Behavioral Processes. Today, uh, Dr. Timberlake will provide a synthesis and overview of his work, which is focused on a behavior systems approach. Today's presentation is entitled, Behavior Systems from Basics to Contemporary Paradigms. Please welcome Bill Timberlake. I don't know. Okay, can you hear me? Loud enough? Not loud enough. Better? Okay, thanks. I would like to thank uh, Bill Paglia for persisting in trying to get me to do this. Um, I would also like to thank a few people who helped me uh, on the way, in particular four undergraduates who started out working with me on conditioning of social behaviors and ball bearings. Um, long ago, uh, graduate students were not interested in doing something like that. So the, the undergraduates are, were Donna Washburn, uh, Glenda Wall, Doug Grant, and Nancy King, and a few a number of graduate students and postdocs, but in particular I'd like to acknowledge Fran and Kathleen Silva and Gary Lucas for their contributions. So this is a tutorial on behavior systems. And you would like to know probably, as I do, what a behavior system is. So a behavior system is a framework of motivational perceptual motor structures and processes that are related to the spatial temporal control of behavior. A behavior system approach attempts to define or combine two kinds of ways to approach learning. One of them is an ethological focus on the organization control of naturally occurring learning and behavior. The second one is a laboratory learning like attention to experimental apparatus and control, showing functional relations between variables and hypothesis testing, or some variant thereof, as we've just found out. I'm missing a nice little piece of paper here. What did I do? Well, I'm going to, ah, I know what I did. I was too clever. So first I'm gonna characterize an ethological approach. I'm gonna characterize it in these terms. The point of view that it takes, which is the perceptual and motivational umwelt of the subject. The methods, which are observation, topographical, and functional definition of behavior and experimentation. The units, which are usually instincts divided into releasers, action patterns, and taxis elements. 
the classes of behavior which are appetitive versus consumatory, the sequences which are behavior chains of these appetitive or these consumatory actions, and a motivational structure model of Tenbergen, which is a hierarchical structure. I'd like to just show you some illustrations of these things. So the perceptual motor, I mean, the, the view is captured by a man named von Uxkel, who at the turn of the century wrote a number of books and drew a number of illustrations. So this is a picture, basically, of a, a, a photorealistic, if you will, a realistic drawing of what a field looks like. And there's a bee here. And here's what this field looks like to the bee. And notice what he got out of this was, this is based on infrared, which they had discovered in terms of the receptors at that point. And bees see patterns in flowers that are in the infrared range. Sorry, the ultraviolet range. We'll go for both. Yeah. It, it's ultraviolet. And then they see uh, water as being a, a reflective agent and green and grass as being an absorbing agent. In terms of their perceptual motor aspects, that's what they see. In terms of what he called functional context, here are three pictures he had of a room. The top room is as a human would see it, so these are different tones. He calls them functional tones. So just imagine everything is in a different color. The second line, the second illustration is the functional tones in terms of what a dog sees. And so you can see the couch, the chairs, the food, and the water are the only things that have functional tones for a dog. And the final one is uh, the functional tones from the point of view of a housefly. The only things that show up there are the things on the plates. In terms of the units that ethologists are concerned with, they're concerned with trying to analyze the kinds of perceptual units that exist and the responses that occur. These are a set of models of the stickleback, the work that I've reviewed briefly. Most of you know about this sort of thing. This is a picture of a stickleback, which is about a three and a half inch long fish. These are models of a stickleback, stickleback that basically preserve only the, the red belly. This, which is a realistic model, lacks the red belly. The red belly is what a releaser or a sign stimulus where people are concerned, uh, where the fish is concerned with a, a, a fish that is creating a nest and a territory is concerned with other fish that appear with this red belly. And what Tenbergen and others were able to show is that there was a component to this, not the realistic picture that you see here, but the key stimulus was, in fact, this red belly. So there were obviously filters or stimulus perceptual filters that were relevant to this red belly. So they were responding to this component of the stimulus, not the realistic looking fish. And they analyzed these things experimentally. The second thing is in terms over here, the third thing and fourth thing in terms of classes, the appetitive versus consumatory. This was originally actually brought out by Wallace Craig, who talked about the variability in behavior that occurs in an appetitive sense, the consumatory action. The one we're familiar with is eating. The one Craig mentioned first was nest displays. The one that uh, Tinbergen talked about, this would have been a consumatory action going towards and doing a display involving in this. Sequences. These are like naturalistic sequences that simply occur. In this case, what we see is what happens when a fish arrives on the scene. A female comes to the area where a male has established a territory. This is the female. She gives a head up display. The male then moves towards her in a sort of a zigzag pattern when he sees this display. She then moves towards him, st still in the head up display. And uh, he then moves to lead her, and she proceeds then to follow. He eventually points to the nest with this peculiar kind of flat angle pointing. She then swims into the nest. He vibrates at a spot near her tail. She spawns, and then he swims through the nest and fertilizes. This whole sequence, as far as we know, runs off for all sticklebacks under, under circumstances where he has established a territory and the female is gravid. There's something you should know that'll come up later. So this is a picture of what actually the sequences are and not what the idealized sequence was, which I just gave you. And what you'll notice is, this is, I'm just gonna look at one side. This is the side 
of the female over here, and that she's the stimulus in this case. These are the behaviors of the male. You'll see that if she does one, two, or three, or four, he will do two or three. But he will not do four, six, five, six. He will only do those if he, she gets, gives him four, or five, or six. And he will only do six if she does seven, and only seven if eight or nine. So there are clumps. The point of this is it isn't this perfect zigzag. There are, in fact, if you will, repertoires that are associated with different areas of this string. OK, the last element of the ethological approach is basically uh, Tinbergen's model. And in, in, if you're not familiar with Tinbergen's model, basically he calls this an instinct center. This is, this is uh, something that's released by shortening of day length. This pr proceeds to produce appetitive behavior or searching behavior, which takes the animal to a place where there's shallow water and warmth. At that point, the animal engages in a series of potential behaviors, including chasing, biting, courting, and nest, nest building. And the, each one of those has a subset of behaviors, which are the action patterns or the fixed action patterns down here. This is a generalized version of this kind of model uh, done by Behrens, in which he says, here's the level, of, highest level, the major instinct. Here's the level of uh, a lower level. Here's the fixed action pattern level. And here's what he called uh, individual movements. So the interesting thing about that is that the hierarchy flows this way. Motivation comes from the top and has to be successively released to engage each subsequent part. It also includes depletion, regulation, things like that. Okay, the laboratory learning approach, which all of you are familiar with, I'm going to maintain, I think I'm going to maintain it over here, that the laboratory learning approach involves a number of a particular point of view, which is a, a very realistic point of view, a, realist, a point of view that's established in terms of, of the physical aspects of the situation, the, uh, the medical physiology, hooks to particular manipulations that you do. The apparatus is usually considered as an arbitrary and general sample of behavior. So the Skinner box is just a box that was designed to produce a replicable behavior that we could manipulate and deal with. We could have made another box. Thorndike, in fact, made another box. The methods here are, are basically laboratory paradigms where you get tuning, operational definitions, and hypothesis testing. Um, I will show you some things that would be familiar to you, which is the, this, this is one paradigm. This is Pavlovian conditioning. The elements of Pavlovian conditioning usually involve a, a US, a CS, which is not represented in the measurement of an autonomic response, initially salivation in this case. You're familiar with this one, pigeon and key. These things are called keys, for those of you who don't know, which is a very strange thing if you ever encounter them as undergraduates. What kind of key is this? But they're little plastic circles, typically. Uh, there's a place where the animal can get food. And here are elements that have to do with sound and or light. The, so key pecking in pigeons is uh, another paradigm. And here's another paradigm, which is lever pressing in rats. Again, notice that. In the first, you notice that the keys are all at this level. The keys are not at some other level. The keys are not on the floor. There's a, there's a variety of things that are not so about these chambers. And in fact, uh, I'm going to argue uh, subsequently that in fact, a big part of the methods in this paradigm are in fact tuning to particular, uh, to particular species. Uh, if any of you have tried to replicate something someone else has done or invent a new or do an app use an apparatus that someone else has invented, what you discover is the best way you, for you to find out is to go and watch them do it. It is not, is not effective for you to try to fake it, usually. It takes a long, long, long time. So this is a really important component. Finally, the kind of paradigm units that we usually look at are, are basically reflexes plus these two guys, which are, how do I wind up with not quite the right numbers here? <laughs> OK, there's a CS followed by a US and a CR. So from your point of view, the CS predicts the US, and the CS then comes to elicit a conditioned response. So that's one unit. A second unit is 
the operant unit, which is here's a discriminative stimulus, which is followed by, uh, which is present in the presence of a response, which is then rewarded by uh, a reinforcer. In terms of chains, the emphasis is on arbitrary chains. This is Barnabas, famous rat. He was taught to, to climb a staircase, to put down a platform, to run across, to climb a ladder, to bring a, a car over to him hand over hand, to then proceed to uh, pedal this car over to a place where he could run through a tube, step into an elevator, which descended to the bottom and as, was, as a function of his raising this particular flag. The emphasis here, as a, in contrast to the ethologist, is on an arbitrary I mean, on completely making this chain up. It is not something that the animal does automatically. OK, so if we want to combine these things, the question is, how would we go about doing that? So this is an attempt. So the view in, in behavior systems has something to do uh, with what I will call animal-centered and theromorphic. It, it is much closer to what we would consider to be an ethological point of view, although I consider most really excellent experimenters to have basically an animal-centered point of view. They want to know if you get down in the apparatus and look, what do you see? And if you don't do this, you're going to present stimuli the animal isn't going to be aware of. If you're not aware that a rat, for example, doesn't, isn't extremely tactile, uh, doesn't have uh, olfaction as one of its primary inputs, and vision is not really good, especially in terms of resolution, then you're not going to run a good experiment. So you actually do take the animal's point of view. But I'm trying to make this explicit. So I want to contrast it also with not only animal-centered, but theromorphic, which is just in contrast with other kinds of morphisms that we're aware of. There's been a trend recently towards People emphasizing, again, uh, anthropomorphism, I want to point out anthropomorphism is where you interpret what the animal's doing as a function of your knowledge as a human. It's as though you were that animal. You're trying to make that interpretation. And this is, in fact, I think, not what people are doing. Because if, uh, what they're doing is based on building a model of this animal. So if I'm a, a primate specialist and I go out and I'm anthropomorphic with respect to my subjects, and so I'll take Safarth and Cheney, who work with vervet monkeys. And they claim that the vervet monkey is doing what a human would be doing in this situation. That's how they get insight into the case. All I can say is if both of us were sitting there watching this vervet monkey, one of us, namely them, would be really good at guessing what the animal was going to do next. And one of them, namely me, would be really not very good. Despite the fact that I would claim I'm as good an anthropomorphizer as the next person, my anthropomorphism attaches itself to computers, to cars, uh, to the US government. So anthropomorphism is not what theromorphism is. Theromorphism is taking the animal's view. Itomorphism I threw in just as sort of a completed. Itomorphism means that all animals and all beings act like I do, feel like I do, and things are caused by that. So this is going successively towards theromorphism. How do we develop a theromorphic point of view? Well, field observations, sensory motor physiology and analysis, experimental analysis of sensing and motor units, experimental analysis of functional organization. So basically, you do it by collecting all the data that you know and then generating a model of an animal. OK, what kind of methods do you use? Well, you do a lot of observation. This observation consists of looking at topographies. It consists of arranging or ordering topographies according to the kind of natural sequences that you see. So in, in the case of rats, which I'm going to spend a good deal of time talking about, one of the things you want to realize is that, that uh, rats actually are social living species. They live on trails a lot. They live in colonies. They are very olfactory. You want to examine the kinds of behaviors they show when they encounter predatory objects. And you wish to observe them in the lab so that you can see what they're doing and get, again, some idea of the kinds of topographies they show so that you can relate these two things together. And then build a little model 
to begin with of this particular animal. There is an interesting thing here in that you, we're treating traditional learning paradigms as based actually on some aspects that the animal has in a niche-related sense. So in other words, I'm going to argue that lever pressing in rats, key pecking in pigeons, maze running in rats is in fact a niche-related behavior. A behavior or is related to niche-related mechanisms. These are the same kind of mechanisms they use in the wild. This is not an arbitrary circumstance. There are arbitrary aspects to it, but in fact their organization of it, I think, is predicated on how they are. And if this is true, this will help you in tuning apparatus. Okay, there's some real advantages to taking this point of view. Finally, I'm going to suggest we're going to use operant and Pavlovian procedures for analyzing behavior systems. You can use the kinds of techniques we use as tools so both operant and Pavlovian procedures can be used as tools, and I'll, I'll illustrate that, how that happens. OK, let's talk about units. We're down to the units section. OK, behavior system units come from a variety of circumstances. So I'm going to divide these up, and after, then I'm going to tell you that you can't really divide it up this way. So, Integration by typical development is, just means that as a function of maturation and the ongoing processes that occur, these kinds of perceptual motor units exist. Now, a perceptual motor unit basically is, is sensory filters and sensitivities and motor components and outputs. That's what a sensory motor or a perceptual motor unit is. It isn't necessarily a reflex. It can be much more complex because there can be multiple inputs and there can be multiple outputs. Okay, so the examples I cited here are, are begging and gull chicks. You're all familiar that if I take a, a, a knitting needle approximately the size of this that has contrasting elements on it, three bands, the middle one contrasts with the other two, and move it back and forth in front of a gull chick that's one or two days old like this, that the gull chick will peck right at the, the contrasting band. And in fact, what you, you probably should be aware is that this knitting needle or this pen is going to work better than the parent. This will release more behavior than the parent will release. Okay? So initially, just through the processes of maturation, this gull chick is set up to peck this particular kind of stimulus, something moving like this with a contrasting dot. Uh, navigation in ants. A man named Rudiger Weger has done, Boehner has done really wonderful things with ants. He, these are desert ants in the Sahara. There's no places that they can navigate from. The question is how do they go out and come back? And what he's shown using some high-powered kinds of techniques uh, involving like trucks with big uh, things over them that trap light and change it in a certain way is that what the ants do is they keep they keep track of their turns as they go out from the nest vis-a-vis -vis the polarization of the light. So they keep a resultant angle always that tells them what direction they are from the, from, from the place that they left. And they use optimotor flow to go back. So these techniques are part of the perceptual motor navigation module that they possess, a relatively complex one that works very effectively. Integration through expression. Prey localization in barn owls. Barn owls have wonderfully complex uh, systems of hearing. And these systems of hearing have to be registered with the real world. Once they're registered, then everything works fine. But registration means that you have to have some feedback from the real world. And your vision and your hearing have to go together. Um, the begging releasers in gull chicks change over time. We don't know exactly. What we do know is that if I use a model like a pen and I let them eat from the parent, but I try this and then I try this eight days later, this no longer gets any effect. Okay, so we have changes in perceptual motor units as a function of some kind of experience and expression. Maze running in rats, um, the example I will use is simply that if I use a radial arm maze that's unbaited, I place a rat on a radial arm maze that's never been on a radial arm maze before. I go through the same procedures I would go through if it were baited. That what happens at the end of this point is that the rat shows you the same efficiency of search as rats who are rewarded. So what this implies is that the radial arm maze has been tuned by experimenters to create the circumstances out of which a rat will show you 
a fairly complex perceptual motor unit, if you will, having to do with efficient search of a given area. Um, the data are published. Some of you look skeptical, which is sort of interesting. OK, how else can we? I should have left this up over here. That would have been. I'm going to now talk about integration by predictability, or perhaps contiguity, and, uh, but, uh, and then uh, integration by result. So I'm going to focus on this one. So let's talk about reconceptualizing Pavlovian conditioning. So Pavlovian conditioning, I'm going to say, is the result of the interaction of Pavlovian procedures with a functional system of behavior. And therefore, it can be used as a tool to explore the organization of a behavior system for two good reasons. One is it doesn't specify a response. So you can explore by changing the nature of the CS and its location with respect to the US. You can explore what's going on. It also allows manipulation of the type and temporal relation of these two things. So it is an ideal probe stimulus in some fashion. And let me show you a complex, don't let me show you sort of a version of something so that you can get a feel for what I'm about to do. This is a predatory subsystem in a rat that I collected together from looking at rats and from getting data from rats that other people had collected. And there are four components. There are actions out here that you can read off of different sorts. These actions are related to the perceptual motor units called modules here. So there's a travel module, a socialize and investigate a chase, lie in wait, capture, test, ingest, reject, hoard. These are all sensory motor modules. This is a, a mode of searching. Notice that each search mode, a general search, a focal search, and a handling consuming. We haven't talked about these guys yet. But these things control a repertoire of different modules and behaviors. So what I'm going to say is if this exists, and I'm saying this exists when I take the rat out of the cage and put him in my environment, this exists. Okay. Whatever reason it exists for, it's there. Okay, I'm not claim making any claims about instinctiveness. I'm not making any claims that learning played no role up to this point. I'm saying this is my rat when I take them out. So if this is true, then if I enter food, stimuli come in this way, and responses go out that way. If I enter food here as a stimulus, right in about here, and then I enter a CS up here, I should be able to pick off some of these different kinds of behaviors. So if I present another rat, OK, as a stimulus, I should, by pairing these two things together, create a relationship that should enable me to get socialization to this rat in the presence of food. That's because socialization is a component of the rat's feeding system. If I used hamsters, it shouldn't work, which it doesn't. So that's one thing I could do. I could also roll a moving stimulus by. I could enter here with something that was arresting, something that was uh, interesting or important to the animal. In this case, a, a rolling ball bearing, which they're very interested in. And I should be able to condition by Pavlovian terms, if that's part of their feeding system, an increase in interaction with the ball bearing. Uh, with lights, I should be able to get investigation. With uh, levers, I should be able to get, again, some kind of predatory kind of reaction. So we know that this already works. We know if you give lights, you sound a light, and you present then food to a, a hungry rat, what happens is the rat starts doing this in the food hopper. He gets in the food hopper, he comes back out. He gets in the food hopper, he comes back out. That's what they do. This is not predicted by anything other than some kind of component analysis like this. If they have a lever, they go over and we emphasize contacting it and pay attention to it. But what they actually do is they grab it, they chew it if they can, they move it back and forth like this. They engage in tugging behavior, which in fact in the original work that was done by uh, Gail Peterson and, and other people at Indiana, they had to make the lever more powerful because the rat would not release it. It was like a tug of war with this lever as they tried to withdraw it before the food. So if I do this with a social stimulus, the question is, what should the rat do? Now, those of you who are aware of this probably figure there are some alternative hypotheses, like they should eat the rat or something like that. 
if you were stimulus substitution. But this is a complex version. Let me call your attention first just to the triangles, but, and let me give you the, this is the percent contact of the animal who's a signal. This, the animal comes out, the animal comes out as a signal and then is followed by food eight seconds later. Here's the acquisition, 1 to 14. Here's the extinction. Here are some baselines. And there are four groups. And the four groups are a little more complicated than I probably should have put up here. But there's two groupings. There's four groupings. There's a pup stimulus and adult. There's an adult stimulus and an adult subject. There's an adult stimulus and a pup subject and two pups. And the interesting thing is, what, there's one animal that doesn't show any learning. And that's the adult for the pup signal. These are pups who've just been weaned. This is, in fact, what we predicted from an ecological point of view. I won't go into the details, but the point is you don't inevitably get something. Okay, on the other hand, all the other three groups showed good conditioning, with the exception of the pup-pup, which as, as basically showed just once in the presence of food and another pup, they just went to it. So there's no discriminative learning here in some sense for pup-pups, but for the other two, there are. In terms of uh, what happens if I roll a ball bearing by a rat and follow it with food, here's what happens. They, over trials, the same kind of issue. They increase their contact with the ball bearing, and then when you stop following it with food, they decrease their contact with the ball bearing. So we're using a CS to get at what this underlying structure might be. These are just control groups that control for different aspects of these circumstances. OK, if I'm able to pick off some of these things, I should also be able to pick off differences as a function of the kind of system that we're talking about. In other words, I've been talking about a feeding system. Suppose that I threw water into the mix. And here's a set of circumstances in which the rat, one group of rats gets water following the ball bearing, one group, and this, there are no response contingencies initially, and one group of rats gets food following the ball bearing. These are just indicators of, it's hard maybe to see these, this is a Pavlovian situation, this is the duration, the mean duration per contact of interacting with the ball bearing. These, the dark ones are for food, and this is the baseline, this is the dark ones for food, and you should look, the durations and the latencies of the initial contact are, are represented here. And what you can see is that under Pavlovian conditioning, under operant conditioning, and again, under reconditioning, that in terms of the duration of contact, that that's much larger for animals that, have, uh, uh, that, are, that are receiving food following this. So the same stimulus produces different results. And this is what you would expect from uh, the point of view that this, if this represents a feeding system and we're in the middle of it, then we should get a lot of interaction. This is perhaps even more interesting. These are conditional probabilities of two more extensive forms of interaction, carrying and chewing. And if we carry, it means we carry it around with us. If we chew, it means we do like this. And you can see the differences between food and water are extremely large under all conditions. The other interesting thing is the differences between Pavlovian conditioning, which means you've got to touch it, and Pav uh, sorry, means that you can do anything you want, and operant conditioning, which means you've got to touch it in order to get the food are really pretty minimal in this case. Okay, they don't, I realize that I, it's true even if I'd started with the Pavlovian, I mean with the operant conditioning. Okay, the last element is if I use different species, I should be able to predict the kinds of behaviors that they should show to a ball bearing. And I use seven different species. Uh, they're all wild caught uh, rodents who uh, are second generation lab who had been raised and had not had any experience with insects. I gave half of them experience with crickets and, and wrote down what they did. I gave the other half uh, experiences with a ball bearing predicting food. Um, I'm not going to show you the data. The, the data basically shows that the insect guys who are predators interact with the ball bearing. Guys who are, current, who are, who are not predators don't interact with the ball bearing and use it instead as a signal to go to food. I just point out here a couple of interesting aspects which uh, if we pick this one, these are the similarities between the way that members of the species treat food and the way that members of the species treat a ball bearing. And you can see that the similarities in, for these two, which are deer mice, Paramiscus leucopus, Paramiscus maniculatus, they have slow approach to the prey with hesitation and recoils. 
during approach, the body is extended, and then they'll suddenly snap back. If they decide to go ahead, they pounce on it with both paws, they pin it, and they bite it in place. Then they'll sit up and hold it like this. They do that to both crickets and to the ball bearing. Other animals do the, the, the same sorts of things. I mean, they do similar things to each stimulus. Okay, let's talk then in terms of what we're talking about now about classes. There are multiple repetitive search modes in the behavior systems approach. The assumption is that there exists a general search mode, a focal search mode, a handling consuming mode, and then post food focal, focal search. Um, why, does, why all this stuff? Well, because that seems to be the way that it works. If you go and watch an animal hunt or an animal go looking for food, they seem to show different strategies as a function of how proximate they are to food, how, how, kind of, what kind of food cues are present. So the repertoires that they show are different as a function of how far they are from food, where far means both psychologically in the sort of uh, temporally and, and spatially. Uh, and I will get on to the other one. Let me give you a sort of a simpler version of this. The assumption is that there exists three search states, a general search state that has a part of a repertoire of locomotion, search, approach, food, a focal search state which has capture, subdue, nosing in the feeder if there's nothing to capture or subdue, or subdue and handling which is consuming and so on. This is a suggestion that these things may exist in other uh, examples as well. So let me talk about several examples of this. So one of the interesting things that you can do is try to manipulate Pavlovian conditioning, which is what we're going to talk about in the first two cases. So let's suppose I look at CSUS interval. So this is a representation, another representation of the kind of behavior system that you've seen. The argument here is that here's the strength of a mode as a function of time, where this is the point at which food comes in a Pavlovian paradigm. And these, this is the first, the last half of the stimulus interval prior to that, and, or the interstimulus, or the interfood interval, and this is the first half prior to that. These are relative strengths of modes. Here's a handling consuming mode. Here is, in fact, a, a focal search mode. And then this typifies the general search mode. So that's the argument. What it means is if I take a US and precede it with a short CS, that I should be conditioning things in the focal search mode area, OK? Because that's what's the top dog here. It is not a winner-take-all system. There's probabilistic aspects to it. But that's the notion. If I have a longer CS that takes a longer period of time, I'm not going to condition this so much as I'm going to condition something that's farther out. And the longer the CS, the more likely I am to condition something out here. And in fact, the two things I called attention to is Pavlov, although he used a variety of procedures. In fact, the best conditioning usually occurs if you have a really short CS and you get this autonomic kind of salivation. However, Jenkins and a number of his colleagues did this study of Pavlovian conditioning, although it's a, 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 tr a trials Pavlovian conditioning where the animal has to be in one place to start the trial, but it's free roaming. And then they, they had a little pole lamp about this high that the light turned on. And 10 seconds later, food came. Under these circumstances, what the dog does is goes and approaches the pole lamp. He play bows like this. He barks. He nuzzles the pay. He does a, a set of complex behaviors. If we were to look at the dog's behavior system, we would probably find that there is social baiting, okay, which we know there is. Okay, so we picked off a social baiting response by changing the CS and changing the nature of the changing the, the, the how long it was. Uh, I can give you a more specific version that doesn't trade any of those things around by just saying, here's a CS that's a tone. Here's one group gets a short CS. Here's one group that gets a long CS. In order to test, though, I now don't have any face valid things to tones that I would suppose that I could, I could be measuring. But what I'm arguing is that I should get hit in the feeder for this short CS. But for a longer CS, I'm not going to get very much to head in the feeder, but I am going to get something else, which I'm going to call the conditioning of this uh, more general search mode. And the question is, how do I find out if it's actually there? 
I mean, I'm, I'm trying not to make this up. I'm trying to test it. So that's the hypothesis. So one way to do this is to use a probe stimulus of some kind that I know will attract their attention in tracking, something that will be a product of, that will be, represent the repertoire that they have in a general search mode. So for rats, we know that is attention to a rolling, a moving stimulus. Now, this is never a stimulus being paired with food. This is just a, a ball bearing at this point. So what I do is condition these two groups, and then I present the CS that I've conditioned, either the short one or the long one, and I then follow it within two seconds by the delivery of a ball bearing. If, in fact, it produces a conditioned state, what I should see is an increase that, that has to do with general search. I should see an increase in going to the ball bearing on the part of the guys who have the long CS. I should not see this for the short CS. Okay, is that, is that clear? I'm using it as a probe. Okay, it says I'm claiming that these the, that these long that this long CS actually is being conditioned, but it's a state that's being conditioned. The kind of behaviors that are conditioned are hard to see at this point. So what I'm going to say is, will in fact can I use an unconditioned probe for general search to get that? And um, the data here's the initial training data. So this is training. This is head and feeder for the long CS, head and feeder for the short CS. You can clearly see that. For the short CS, they put their head in the feeder a lot. For the long CS, they don't put their head in the feeder much. So it looks like we've not conditioned anything, which is the typical way that we look at Pavlovian conditioning. Yes, long CS US intervals don't produce much. However, if I now roll ball bearings by them and there's no food in this situation, there's been dis extinction of most of the context by simply pre pre presenting ball bearings by themselves for six days. Now I present ball bearings following either uh, one of these CSs or by itself, and look for the change from the baseline of going to and interacting with the ball bearing. And what you can see is that for the long CS group, I get an increase, a significant increase in contacting the ball bearing. For the short CS group, I don't. And we've used this kind of probe technique several times. And last, it should mean that if I take something like a ball bearing, which is supposed to move, which is supposed to get at this, I'm tracking you, I'm interested. If I take along a ball bearing as a as the CS, which I've shown you that I can do, and I now change the CSUS interval so that it's either very short, medium, or longer, that I should not get good conditioning in terms of uh, contact of the ball bearing at the short one. Okay, because it's not in that range. And in fact, this is the shortest CS, this is the medium CS, and this is the longest CS. Okay, adjunctive behavior. We're going to run out of time. Uh, John Stadden isn't here, but I will show you his picture. Adjunctive behavior is simply presentations of these CSs. John called this terminal behavior. This is facultative behavior. This is interim behavior. I would say that what you do when you see this, and I have a lot of data to suggest it, is this is focal search behavior. Okay, it may or may not be just a exclusive terminal behavior, but it will be behavior that's related to focal search. This is going to be a post-food focal search that is more or less seems to be elicited and does not grow as the, the inner food interval gets longer, which is what this, this is reason this is a tent. And the facultative behavior is general search behavior. And the interim behavior is something really, which is mostly polydipsia, is something very specific to food. If you do food things, you don't get any interim behavior. Okay. If you do water things, you don't get any interim behavior. If you get another variety of things. So there's something really special about it. But it fits right in here between the post-food focal search and the general search. OK, conditioned inhibition, you'll have to take my word for it. <laughs> Now I'll show you. Condition inhibition, here's a study. Anyway, here's the CS plus, here's the CS minus. It's that kind of condition inhibition setup. You can use the ball bearing probe to find out if the CS minus actually conditions something, not an, inhi not an inhibition, but a, 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 a general search state. Okay. And you get the same kind of effects. Okay. That is to say, that produces an increase in ball bearing behavior if you present that cue. Backward conditioning, you can do similar kinds of things. In operant conditioning, FR versus VI, FR is, in fact, going to be focal search. Notice that it's really hard to get an animal to do an FR. You have to do it a little at a time. 
You have to like drag him away from this. That's because I would argue that he's in a focal search state when he's doing CRF. Okay, and then you go up to two and he's still pretty happy and then you go to 10 and he goes, what? You know, if you'll excuse my use of this term, you've gone too far. You have to take him slowly so you can expand this focal search state because an FR is like this. Now VIs are different. VIs intrinsically are check it out, check it out. So they're much more akin to uh, a, a, a more general search state. Self-controlled choice, I think, has some ramifications here because usually we have a big thing that's really close. This should put you focal search state here. This should be something you should prefer to something that is farther away, even though it might be bigger. And between versus within meal responding, as Collier has pointed out, you get real differences in terms of the way animals act. That's because within meal means I'm trying, between meal, I'm sorry, I'm trying to respond in order to get a meal is definitely general search behavior. Whereas when you're in the meal, you're probably more close to focal search. Well, let's talk briefly about sequences and then I will quit. Okay, this is a sequence that's a real sequence for a rat. What I'm maintaining, I've, I've simplified that diagram, and I've simply said, here's what happens when a rat is out wandering around its environment and sees a bug that's moving away from it. Notice what happens is we have, we're out traveling around because we're hungry. We see a bug, a distal moving stimulus. That causes, that enters the chase module, causes us to track and run after. We get a proximal moving stimulus. We grab it with the mouth and paws. We get tactile cues that cause holding and chewing, which gives us food cues, which <coughs> creates that. So we get out of this system ethological kinds of behavior. In other words, we, we now can do ethology using the little picture that I showed you. Okay, on the other hand, what does this mean about what happens when we do conditioning? Well, conditioning means that you present that you present a CS-US interval here. So we're controlling now the presentation of the CS. What that means is that if you have a short CS, that we're presenting this and he's not in the general search mode, we're in the focal search mode, and that short CS now predicts, if it's a ball bearing, for example, still, if it predicts food coming very close, you're not gonna get conditioning of all the things related to chase because you're at a tail end of the system. You're in the focal search mode, which doesn't have that repertoire. If you have a longer CS, you're going to get that repertoire out of this same organization. And open conditioning, and I'll, I'll use in two versions. Here's a response contingency, again, between go to the feeder. I just made that up. That's the response contingency. And the SD, I'm going to call a ball bearing because it's easier to see what's going to happen. If I present the ball bearing and he has to go to the feeder and it's fairly close down here, this is not a problem. The animal uses this as an SD and goes to the feeder. Okay, the ball bearing's being presented but very close when food is likely to come given that he, he understands his response contingency and learns it, which he will. Now if all of a sudden I back this SD up and make it farther and farther away, okay, and create the circumstances out of which I no longer have him able to go as fast to the feeder and the SD is occurring longer from when food comes, to the extent that that happens, I'm liable to get misbehavior because what will emerge is interacting with the ball bearing. So the way in which you get misbehavior is that. Uh, the motivational system, there's all kinds of fun stuff with uh, chickens. Other people have done things like this. This is not unique. Uh, Michael Damian has done it with uh, mating courtship systems in, uh, in uh, quail. Uh, Michael Hanslow has done pre-encounter, post-encounter, circus strike modes in, uh, in terms of rats and shock are aversive defensive systems. He has further showed that there is a real uh, underlying neurophysiological basis for this, the distinctions between these modes that we're making. Jerry Hogan has done it with chicks. Let me say that behavior systems incorporates aspects of ethology just as a review. So we get in observation, complex perceptual motor units, unlearned sequences, appetitive and consumatory behavior and motivational structure. We add to it more data. Learning is related to perceptual motor units. It separates activity 
of appetitive behavior into modes and clarifies how learning enters sequences. It meshes pre-organized aspects of behavior with laboratory paradigms. As far as learning goes, it incorporates the same careful definition and measurement, acquired units, laboratory paradigms. It adds explicit concern with animal centeredness, complex units and repertoires, unlearned sequences, conditioning of states, motivational structures, and multiple mechanisms. Finally, I'm going to claim two things fast. Behavior system ties to neurophysiology, development, evolution, genetics are easier using this kind of approach because it's real concrete. It gets you in at the perceptual and motor level. We're not trying to identify what the predictive, where the little circuitry is that does predictions. We're starting at a periphery. I think we have a better chance to do neurophysiology by doing that approach. And finally, the summary, the behavior system approach attempts to make explicit perceptual motor and motivational structures and processes that the subject brings to any circumstances. Everything you do with a rat or with a pigeon has got this stuff in it. The expression of a behavior system is based on both pre-organized and learned relations among stimuli responses and states. Pavlovian and operant conditioning procedures can be thought of as techniques that use learning to organize and engage the expression of a behavior system, and you can test all these things. Thank you. A couple of minutes for questions, if anyone would like to uh, have an observation to make. When we were training our seagulls to go out and study or, or locate a two to three inch ring, red ring, over a 10 to 20 mile square area, we tried to teach them the way to do it with one group. In the other group, we just let them develop their own way. And the group that developed their own way could do it in one third of the time. Yeah, I think I think actually most uh, psychology apparatus has figured out the ways that animals do things yeah. to a point and, and designed them that way. I mean, that's the reason they all look the same, not just because they're commercially available, because they work. Yes? Okay, so the question is, um, there's at least a couple of views of Pavlovian conditioning. One of them is based on predictability of the U.S. given the C.S. One of them is based on contiguity, where Ralph, this is Ralph Miller's version, in which the predictability part is a performance aspect, but the real learning occurs at the, at the uh, um, contiguity. Uh, I actually kind of like Ralph's version myself. I'm not sure that I can say, <laughs> I'm not say, I, I'm not sure I can give you really compelling data, but I can tell you that uh, in the case of a post-food CS, that you can, that I think we've shown reasonably convincingly that you do get conditioning of a state, not a specific set of responses, but a state. And that if you then uh, test for that state by a variety of relearning procedures or changing things around, uh, you can show evidence for it. So I certainly think states are by contiguity. I think, and that, that contiguity on either side, and, and in terms of performance um, issues, I wouldn't be surprised that contiguity is important, but uh, I think the quality of the CS matters, and so contiguity that you measure may not be the contiguity that works for the animal. There are different uh, there are different kinds of unit sizes, if you will, for animals and not. Thank you. I think we need.